Thursday morning, and welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And we're actually recording this an hour before Thursday morning really hits. <laughs> yeah, it's actually Thursday afternoon, and I had to use time travel in order to get this to Pixie by Thursday morning for it to go up on WLRA. We're just magical like that. Consequently, we're just really bad and behind on all of our news. WLRA, radio is magic. <laughs> Just so. We're just really behind. That's why you're not hearing anything that happened Thursday, so, uh, yeah. All of you enslaved by the spider god, we're, we're sorry. We didn't warn you. I, for one, welcome our new spider overlords. <laughs> Gotta be fine with it, as long as they would stop depositing their eggs in my torso. Hey, have we already gone off the rails? Like, has the show already crashed and burned? Yep. Explosively. Woohoo! We've been in it, like, less than a minute, really. Go team! It's impressive. So, basically, three of what are potentially amongst the best pieces of media this year are zeitgeisty this week. Uh, XCOM, Dishonored, and Argo. And up until, like, three hours ago, we had coverage for none of them. But I have just gone and seen Argo at the very last minute, so we are not complete failures at journalism. To be fair, I have the largest war machine convention of the year coming up in two weeks and would like to eat while I'm attending, so that's why I haven't purchased XCOM yet. Yeah, no, all three of us have just had packed schedules. Like, Also, I really need to make it through the semester of school, so uh, yeah, buying another highly addictive, very customizable game doesn't sound like a good idea to make that happen. By all reports, XCOM is amazing like it was it's sort of reasonable to expect before it came out that it would not be as good as it was seeing as it's inheriting this legacy of being a strategy game for crazy people who play pc strategy games back in the 90s and that's a very complicated and difficult genre right this is this is like for people who thought that mech commander wasn't an advanced enough game yep and then the other thing is that it is very difficult. Like, you perm your characters die, and then they're permanently dead, and you... And they will die, there's pretty much no way around it. And if your saves are not in the right position, it is very easy to get in a situation where you won a couple of individual missions, but your global protect the Earth from being destroyed by aliens mission will fail and you have no recourse but to start this 30-hour game from scratch. So, yep. it is a crazy difficult and seemingly inaccessible game, but by all reports, everybody loves it, and it is very easy to get into, even if you've never played strategy games before. I'll put it this way. The week after War Machine Weekend takes place, if I have any free time whatsoever, which I think that's actually like coming up on... Uh, winter break for, or not winter break, uh, fall break for my school. I think that's when I'll be picking this up and just dedicating a week to playing through it. But secondhand reports aside, uh, XCOM and Argo seem to have something in common because my first thought when I walked out of Argo is that was stress the movie. It's just like, oh, right, the movie is over now. I don't have to have my hands tightly clenched to the armrests constantly anymore. Uh, Argo is a movie about the 1979 Iranian hostage crisis, directed by and starring Ben Affleck. I must say, Ben Affleck is a very attractive man, and he seems to be a pretty good director on top of that. Argo is a very visually interesting movie. Everybody is dressed like it is 1979, and they're smoking, and they're drinking, and they're driving Cadillacs, and they don't have cell phones, and... Argo has a really cool visual conceit where there's a few instances where it's doing uh, historical footage. Since this is based on a real historical event, they will have footage that actually came from the 1979 Iranian hostage crisis. And when you see that footage, obviously it has film grain on it because it was shot on film, and usually cheap film at that. And so... Depending on the tone of any scene in the movie, sometimes there is artificial film grain, and sometimes there is not, and it all just sort of comes together to make the film look very good. It is kind of like 
I tweeted once about the original Mass Effects film grain filter, which was really quite powerful, that that looked amazing on Mass Effect, but should never be used by any other video game ever, because it it is easy to abuse, and I think this movie would have looked kind of bad if they had put the whole movie in film grain, but they do it selectively based on narrative events, and it it really gives it a nice vibe. The idea is that there are six American ambassadors, or not ambassadors, but people who were working at the American embassy who escaped and are hiding out after the embassy was stormed by angry Iranians. And so Ben Affleck has to exfiltrate them, which is to say get them out of the country without anybody noticing. And he does this by making a fake sci-fi movie called Argo. Uh, John Goodman and Alan Arkin are fake Hollywood people. and No, they're real Hollywood people who decide to help fake it. Okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, I could even take it to another level, which is that they are real Hollywood people making a real movie, playing real Hollywood people making a fake movie. So meta. Right. I mean, th this really happened, so... While they may have changed some of the names in the film, these were actually real people. Yep. In some way, that kind of lessens the tension, because if you know history, then you might know how all of this works out in the end. But I seem to have developed a fairly sophisticated ability to have been spoiled on a plot, but not think about those spoilers when I'm consuming a work. And so it's like... Even though I know the history of the Iran hostage crisis, I'm sitting there in the theater being like, what's going to happen? Just turn off the part of my brain that knows the answers. This was all based on, like, actual CIA declassified documents. So, it is very stressful, but also very funny. If you've seen the trailer for it, you'll know that there's some good lines, such as... You don't have a better bad idea than this? This is the best bad idea we have, sir. By far. And it's funny when they're all making the movie up to be fancy, even though it's like a terrible Star Wars ripoff. Like, there's a scene where they're putting on costumes, and there's this character that is literally just a blue Wookiee. Like, you took a Wookiee costume, and you dipped it in blue paint. And it's like, no, this is an original sci-fi work. It is two hours long, but to me it felt really short, because I was just... My heart was pounding the whole time. I would... I would say this was a very good movie, and very intelligently made, but I would almost avoid seeing it if you have a lot of stress in your life, because... Or, unless you really like that. I've never been the type to like horror movies, because I don't particularly derive much pleasure from being scared. And this is like that, but a thriller. And I guess if you like being thrilled, it's for you. It is structured like a heist movie, like in Ocean's Eleven. So, the first... There's three acts. The first act consists of preparation, making the plan, uh, getting the team together. The second act is... In which everything can go wrong to disrupt their plan. Yep. I guess there's... There's two parts to the second act. There's like a simulation part where it's... This is how it's supposed to go. If everything goes right... And then there's the actual operation when everything goes wrong. So you see you see the plan, and then you see the plan fail. And then there's the denouement where everybody... Where the ending happens and you feel good about it. And it tells you, like, these are the real world long-term outcomes for these people. Oh, Argo was a good movie. I recommend everybody see it. Yep, it's been on my list of things I really wish I could go see right now. But again, money conservation, ugh. As 80s as this movie looked, I hear that the mom out of Pokemon Black looks like she's in an 80s movie. <laughs> Transition time! Uh, I actually just, before the show started here, began playing Pokemon Black 2. So expect that review coming in the near future. Yeah, I'm actually working on news packages for uh, WFLY TV. However, so that's um, being my priority right now. 
It's the busy part of the semester. Yay. Indeed. In fact, I'll be up at the Galpin Ghost Arcade later today. Which we have done features with before. Go look them up in our archives. They're excellent shows. They are. And, uh... I still want to do a uh, broadcast of another tournament. That would be great. Um, Doc has expressed interest in us doing that. It's just a matter of getting your butt up here. I've heard it's hard to relocate my butt. (laughs) Not the rest of you, mind you, but just Just your butt. butt. In fact, it is so difficult to relocate his butt that he usually just walks around without it. That's why if you look at him from behind, it's just flat. I, I just leave it here in the chair. <laughs> if he brings it with him, then it's like, badonk, but that rarely happens. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, currently I'm, I'm at this part where I run into Bianca, who is supposed to be finding me to give me my first Pokemon. And she says, by the way, I'm looking for someone. Do you know a person named Pixie? And there's a yes-no box. <laughs> if If you say no... Literally, she just walks away and the game ends. And it has already given me two yes-no boxes in, a, in the conversation with your mom, where mom is like, do you want a Pokemon? And you can say no, and she'll be like, what? Let me try that again. And it just so basically it forces you to say yes. And then there's another one where it's like, hey, do you want a Pokedex? And it does the same thing. No thanks, mom. I think I'm going to finish school, go to law school, and become a famous lawyer. That's a silly dream for someone in the Pokemon universe. What are you, stupid? Go kidnap animals. Put them in little boxes. Sen, is there even a need for lawyers in the Pokemon universe? Because obviously nobody is enforcing the laws. They just appear to resolve everything with freaking animal fights. Yeah, Pokemon is just like League of Legends. (laughs) All of the problems are solved by, you know, preteen children. Well, yes, in two ways. It's like, yes, the preteen children are the one who are busting the global crime syndicates. And also, if there ever is a dispute, you solve it by pitting animals to death fights, something preteens are the best at. Like, I'm sorry, but isn't the role of courts and police to take down the international crime syndicate? Apparently not. Not in the Pokemon world. So, uh, I guess we should move on. Other universes wherein disputes are solved by repetitive fights. Borderlands 2 has actually seen quite a bit of, uh, of an expansion since our last cast. Captain Scarlet and her Pirate's Booty DLC is the first entry in their season pass, which is $20? 30 30 Which actually was released on the day that the Mechromancer was supposedly going to be released. So, we got the Mechromancer a week early, which I believe we talked about in our last show. We did. Have you had a chance to play her at all, Pyro? No, I have not even created one yet, unfortunately. Because I mentioned, I remember you mentioning that you wanted to basically edit her level up. I very much do. She is the character class that I intend to play as when I beat the game. Okay, so I went ahead and hit no, I don't know who Pixie is. And she went, oh wait, you're Pixie. How do you know this? It's like, why did you even ask me this question if you knew the answer? Also, why are you not offended now that I have clearly lied to your face about my own identity? (laughs) Shouldn't you, like, smack me now? I lied to you. Now give me this super powerful creature. Man, everyone in the Pokemon universe is just bad at everything. Except for fighting. So yes, with uh, Captain Scarlet and her pirate booty, you get... A new campaign uh, setting, new guns, a new vehicle. You don't get any like additional upgrades for your character or more levels, but you just get more stuff. Uh, this is a new area, which is the Sand Pirate Bay. No water, but it is they're sand pirates. And you get a new vehicle called the Sand Skiff. It features a new quest hub, a bunch of new quests, more plot which I'm not sure if they are, like, setting this to take place after the events of Borderlands 2 conclude. Because I can only imagine the game ends with, like, Handsome Jack's violent death. I, this, I have I have not seen the middle of Borderlands 2, but I happen to have seen the very end. And I will say that it matters immensely if this is set in-universe before the end or after the end of Borderlands 2. Because... There are things that happen. I just went through a quest today in which Handsome Jack rewards you for killing yourself. <laughs> the quest literally says, go kill yourself. Excellent. Is the reward for the quest a 
cash sum less than the revival fee, because that would be pretty awesome. It is 12 bars of iridium. That's a pretty good reward. But in response to finishing the quest, Handsome Jack is just like, yeah, I just proved that I can make you kill yourself for money. Grats with that. <laughs> Death is only a minor inconvenience in this game, so whatever. Yeah, my, my response was like, hey, Jack, you just proved that I'm willing to trade 7,000 uh, 7, credits and a minor inconvenience for 12 bars of iridium. Thanks for that. The other hand is that death may or may not be a minor inconvenience depending on story events. As it's like, if you have Aerith getting knocked out every battle in Final Fantasy VII, but at some point your Phoenix Downs stop working, it's like, why don't these Phoenix Downs work anymore? Because the plot dictates it. The the really humorous thing is one of the lines that the the Revivomatic machine gives you is, by using this machine, you have forfeited your rights to reproduce. <laughs> I imagine that that works like Rumpelstiltskin style, is that you can still reproduce, but you owe your firstborn to the Hyperion Corporation. Or all of your born. Right, all of them. Hyperion would not settle for merely one child. We're going to turn them into more engineers because you keep killing all of ours. Oh, Captain Scarlet's Pirate's Booty DLC is $10 if you buy it on your own, on its own. Yep. Which seems a little steep. It seems like if you're going to get this and you like Borderlands 2, then it is likely that you would get the season pass instead because level cap raises are almost assured to happen in the other DLCs. Yeah, that, that's traditionally what Borderlands has done. As I understand it, I don't believe the level increase occurred with uh, Dr. Ned's zombie uh, hordes. But that didn't happen until the later DLC content. Yeah, that was... I believe it was Mad Moxie's where you got the um, level cap raise and the bank. Oh, I'm kind of disappointed that the DLC was, hey, let's add an entire new character. Like, I always enjoyed the DLC that was, well, let's expand on characters that we've got. Like, Claptrap's Robot Revolution, I thought that was hilarious. Uh -huh. that, that was just incredibly fun. Dr. Ned was awesome because it was just Dr. Zed with a mustache. The other thing that makes that doubly true is that uh, back when they were, like, doing DLC for Borderlands 1, their stable of characters was not especially large. They didn't have a lot of name characters to work with, so it kind of makes sense if you add them. And, but now, And likewise, those characters didn't have a ton of developed personality on them. Right. They were just, this is the Doctor, and this is the Gunrunner. And they became awesome later, but they were just the Doctor and the Gunrunner at that point. And at, at the time, Marcus wasn't even the Gunrunner. Marcus was the guy who drove the bus. If I remember correctly, Marcus didn't become the Gunrunner until Borderlands 2 came around. No, his face was on the vending machines from day one. Okay. I mean, they didn't do any dialogue about it, but he had his face on the vending machines for the guns. Pixie, I hear there's been a development in your Pokemon tribulations. Perhaps a repeat of earlier events. In a are, are we still just lying to poor Bianca? Yes. Being deliberately uh, contrary. You're just tormenting that poor, stupid girl. But it's okay, the game is gonna but thou must me into doing it anyway. I think earlier your mom said to you that- Love them tropes. I, I don't want to be selfish, but it would be nice if you were a little more agreeable. Because she had been saying no to every mandatory yes question. Stop fighting with me! Just leave home as a, as a very young child, or teenager, and then, you know, do animal fights. Like, just be responsible and do that. Ah, uh, Pokemon. You make no sense. I don't know if it's just that, like, my eyesight is bad or these sprites suck, but it looks like Bianca has a very epic mustache. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Bianca always has an epic mustache. In fact, not just this Bianca. All people who are named Bianca, fictional or real, have epic mustaches. But they also have cloaking fields, so they can, they can make their mustaches be disguised if they want, but secretly... All Biancas have mustaches. I think my brain hurts from how dumb that was. Nerd talk, lying to you for the sake of insanity. We've said worse. Likewise, we've made up far worse. Alright, so I guess it's time to decide. Oh, I see. It's the lower part of the frame of her glasses. Did Bianca wear glasses in the last game? I don't think she did, but she apparently does now. Great, Bianca's going blind. Art changes. Updated character art. How dare they? Well, I imagine 
It's because, you know, she's a super nerd now because she's Professor Juniper's assistant. So it, as, as part of becoming smart and interested in scientific topics, her eyes just atrophied. So that's glasses mean smartness. Once you're smart, then your eyes go bad. I'm trying to decide on a Pokemon. What do I pick for my starter? This is a huge deal. It's the same three from the last game. I know. So pick your Tepig and you're good to go. Yeah, except, like, Tepig's final form is a fire-fighting-type combination, and I don't know that I like that. Which sounds awesome. I don't know, I always went with the grass thing, but I always pick the grass Pokemon. Bulbasaur for life. My big thing with that is that you can find tons of wild grass and water types. You don't ever really see wild fire types, generally. Until you go roaming on the volcano. No, and the other side about it adding an extra type during its evolution is that basically amounts to it adding extra weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That is my big thing with that. You don't gain a lot of strengths from having the extra type compared to the extra damage you would take from things that are strong against fighting. So shall we go back to the League of Legends while she decides? Um, okay, so first off, Season 2 World Championship is over. Team Taipei Assassins won. Yep, congratulations, Taipei Assassins, for showing what a push really looks like. And congratulations, Team Azubu Frost, for having a great showing in the finals. I have a problem congratulating them based on the fact that they got caught cheating. They did? Yep. During the playoffs, it was found that Team Azubu Frost was actually looking... Uh, members of the team were actually looking at the display screens to the side of the stage to view the minimaps. Ah uh, yes, I remember. I saw this story on The Verge, and the conclusion there was that TPA was kind of screen monkeying too. Yes, both teams were, and while the information gleaned from those screens did not have any direct influence on the play, it was uh, decided by a very intense looking at those cameras that yeah, this happened, and both teams were fined thirty thousand dollars. Out of their substantially more than thirty thousand dollar prize pool, so it which is kind will be of a... donated to charity. Oh, th that's cool. Yeah, riots not riots not going to be keeping that money. Yes, that that money is all getting donated to charity, which I suppose is better than just riot taking it back. Ooh, ooh! Speaking of charities, to kill a DJ is coming up, and Nerd Talk will, as usual, be participating. Indeed we will. We have a kind of sucky time slot, but, you know, whatevs. We'll be there. So Thursday, November 15th, from 6 a.m. to noon, we will be doing a non-stop six-hour broadcast, raising money for Advocate Hope Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. Right? I'll actually be driving up. Who knows? We might be reviewing um, some of those games that we don't have right now. We'll be doing giveaways and raffles and all sorts of fun things, so keep an eye on um, my Twitter at NerdTalkPixie uh, for more information on that, or like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash NerdTalk. Who knows, you donate enough money, we may in fact light a monkey on fire on air. No. Remember, I use the term may. And by on air, he means on radio. Which means that you have no evidence that it's actually a monkey. On radio, you will hear a burning monkey. We could just be blowing on the microphone and making it sound like fire. But you donate enough money, we will pretend to light a monkey on fire on the radio. I'm just going to commit the flaming remains of this monkey up for auction. You already burned the monkey? So premature. I can make another. <laughs> it was actually a prime ape, not technically a monkey. Although... I don't even know that the distinction between apes and monkeys is very clear in Pokemon. It is a half-monkey ape, prime ape, man-key. I don't know, well, it's a Pokemon. If I'm Deal with right, it. Aren't the only, like, normal animals in the Pokemon universe, like cats and dogs? Aren't those still a thing there? Well, are they even that? Because what is Growlithe? Is, is Growlithe even a cat or a dog? It's, like, kind of both of those. I'm not sure... It is basically both a cat and a dog, but cute. Yep, so back on the subject of Borderlands, like, I, I've done a bit of research into the Mechromancer, and while I'm not playing one right now because I'm kind of leaving that to Pyro, she seems ridiculously cool. Like, uh, Gearbox has said that this is not the last additional class that's going to be added to this game. 
they, they will be adding, uh, as I understand, two to three additional classes. And anything that they can do to make the game last longer, I think, is a great thing. I, I'm loving this game just on the pro prospect of there's always something you can be doing in Borderlands. Based on the fact that the most important part of the gameplay, or the most important part of the game experience of Borderlands, is just the shooting and the moment-to-moment -moment feel of aiming and killing enemies, that is basically infinitely repeatable, so... If you just add a new frame to it, add a new character class, or some small new narrative elements, that is enough to keep you coming back for a long time. The core of it is forever. Yeah, pretty much all of the Borderlands expansions were a little increase to the plot, and new guns, and a new location. That That's all any of them were. And that's all this particular type of game needs. Right. Speaking of new locations, Twisted Tree Line is getting reworked. <laughs> and we're back on League of Legends. Yes, the Twisted Tree Line is going to be reworked as the Shadow Isles. Which sounds pretty cool, actually. Along with the Shadow Isles, we're going to see uh, new skins for existing characters, an entire new character, the first champ that's going to be added during Season 3, Elise the Spider Queen, who kind of works like Jason, that she's a character that has two different forms that function in different ways. Uh, the main difference being that uh, while Jace is an AD champion who has slight amounts of uh, AP added in, Elise is going to be almost universally AP-based. So she will take the form of a mage who uh, can go melee assassin based on her uh, form. Now looking at this promotional art on the front page of LeagueOfLegends.com, she looks kind of like Kerrigan in Queen of Blades form. And then, in narrative sense, she is basically Lolth from D&D. &D. Yep. Her passive is that... Uh, based on what level her ultimate is, she summons a spider minion when she changes forms. So, kind of cool. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, in addition to her, they will also be adding new skins for items. Uh, the wards will be receiving skins, which it's not yet confirmed whether these are viable permanent skins or whether this is something that's just going to be going on for the Halloween uh, in-game holiday. I was playing a match the other day, and... That there was this image that kept appearing, and it had like an eyeball associated with it, so I was like, oh, this must be given the enemy's vision. I don't know what this is. I was like, is this a ward skin? It turned out it was the summoner spell Clairvoyance, which I had just never seen before because which nobody no uses one it. Takes. Yeah, the occasional support takes that spell. I was like, oh. Um, yeah, uh, they also will be adding a feature that I know Pixie's been asking for since she started playing. New purchasable summoner icons. Woo! -hoo. Well, except for the summoner icons purchasable suck. part. <laughs> well, the ones in the game right now are terrible, but you know I'm not opposed to them adding more. I want the season two championship icons to stick around because they're slick looking. Well, if you did register with the website that they gave during the finals, which I know Pyro, you got that information. Thanks to uh, Sen, I. Was not watching the finals live, but Sen sent the information to me over Skype, so I was able to get to it just in time. In that case, the Season 2 Summoner icon should be coming to players later this week. It is a Riven image? Do we know what it looks like already? It is the Season 2 uh, icon, which looks like the Riven uh, Season 2 character. Ah. Which that skin will be available through the 22nd, at which point it will go into the vault and be un unattainable. <laughs> Although the particles on it are kind of broken right now, so it's the promise of a functional skin someday. You know, maybe. So new ward skins kind of scares me, because that seems well, like... Well, they always do things like that during the holidays. Yeah. But the question is whether it's a purchasable thing that is then permanent on your account. Well, the thing that concerns me is just the gameplay ramifications of, oh, I would have played in one way if I had recognized the fact that these were wards, but they looked differently, so I didn't know how to react to them. I don't know, I suspect it'll be obvious enough. Well, that's cool. 
The other thing that I've had kind of difficulty with on that count is playing against enemy champions with skins. So I guess this isn't a new problem in the game, but there's actually a bit of a solution to the difficulty there. Yep. Uh, Riot has decided that there is now a small random chance upon playing a co-op versus AI game that the enemy bots will pick a skin at random to use. So, oh, hey, that's neat. so if you only yep. play bots for your first 20 levels, like Pixie and I did, then you will not be completely taken aback when you, account, when you actually have to fight against somebody in a skin and you have no idea who they are. I still find it highly entertaining when we play together that there are still some champs in the game that you two have never seen because of your experience with bots. Well, it was like, yeah, very recently there was an Urgot, and I've, I've seen a couple of Urgots since then, but I was like, who is this person? I have never encountered this champion. Who is this person, and what do they do? I have to point oh, out... Yes, at... He fires super long-range missiles at you from completely protected distances. At this exact moment, I noticed that the Humble eBook bundle has sold 66606 bundles. Oh, and it just ticked over to 7. And still, there's three sixes in there, so clearly that means something. There have also been uh, five extra books added for people who donated above the average. And this is totally expected so because hooray. Humble bundles always have this bonus that comes in at the second week. And this is mostly webcom- well, I guess all webcomic stuff. There's two Saturday- And all, like, really high-profile webcomic stuff. Yeah, there's- Randall Monroe! It doesn't get any bigger than this. It's Penny Arcade, Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, and XKCD. That's- If you had to pick the three biggest webcomics, that would be it. <laughs> Maybe questionable content slits in there above Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, but it's, it is a close race. I'd say even then, that's a maybe. Yeah, that is a maybe. For sure. Huh? If you didn't buy it at the very beginning, you're... the average price has gone slightly up from the already high average price. It is now thirteen fifty for... What to do? Eight plus... Still, this is like over $100 worth of content, yeah. so... 13 yeah, books for $14? A blue, blue, blue. Cry all the way home. It's a pretty good deal. Indeed. So, speaking on book topics, the second book from uh, Benjamin Yahtzee Croshaw has been released. Jam is now available. Yep, that's right. I'm advertising for also, Yahtzee. Because why not? His last book was freaking amazing. Also, um, speaking of his last book, I have Mog World in audiobook form, which he personally narrated. It's like 13 hours long. hours old. of Yahtzee narrating. I have to imagine him narrating And he does like different voices hilarious. for the characters, and it's, it's brilliant, and I love it, and I recommend it highly. I may have to pick that up uh, after uh, the next holiday, or for the next holiday. Yahtzee has an appealing voice as it is, but... Doing anything other than the fast ramble and doing different characters sounds amazing. I, I don't know. Him reading Shakespeare was pretty awful all those years ago. I don't recall that. When did that happen? Uh, that was an April Fool's that he did for Zero Punctuation. Ah. He read in the most monotone voice possible. <laughs> nice. So this works out uh, like Gilbert Gottfried reads Fifty Shades of Grey. That does sound like the worst thing ever, actually. It's it's pretty hilarious. It's pretty funny. Yeah. I'm guessing that's something that was on the Funny or Die network. I believe it was on YouTube. I have no but idea. It may have I remember seeing there. it on YouTube, but I don't remember the original source. Yeah, see, it's available on YouTube. It sounds hysterical. It is. It, and very it is awkward. Pretty funny. That that is the Fair instance enough. where Pixie recognized that. Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey was not merely vaguely erotic, but was in fact just fully... Straight up porn. Yes. It is pornography. Again, kind of disappointing that we can't just sell it as such. Alright, further newsage. There's been a new Indeed. Xbox dashboard update. They say it's supposed to be faster now. No special faster, new features, stronger, but with more fire. less laggy. 
I prefer my version, but whatever. Speaking of lag, I, I keep dragging us back to Pokemon, but one thing I'm noticing as I'm playing this is that it seems to take longer to load areas, like, specifically when you enter a building. There's, like, a weird delay where it does, like, a slow zoom into your character and then opens up the new room. Huh. It's disappointing that I it would do that. I always thought cause... Pokemon was, you know, kind of adequate. Area transition lag is kind of an expected thing on systems with CDs because you have to read from the disc, but th but right. DS cartridges are these little flash cartridges, and they should read real fast. That's yep. The thing that portable gaming has kind of always had going for it, except for maybe the Vita, is it has retained the original NES style. You don't have to think about frame rates because they're always good. Maybe not. I don't know. I still kind of just want the Vita to, you know, have Sony actually back it. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to, it's out! We don't know what to do with it. I would... The thing that would tempt me to buy a Vita is Assassin's Creed Liberation at the end of the month, because of... I, I'm a huge fan of the series, and there's a bundle wherein you can get the... Vita and Liberation for what is basically the price of the Vita now, $250. That's like, hey, the game I is free. I would just like something that I can't have on a console that I already own. Yeah, this this sounds like a good deal. And I would be all over it if there was any prospect of other interesting software for the Vita. I fear right. that if I did purchase it, it would be like, yeah, I've got Assassin's Creed Liberation, and that is the only use this console has for me. Yep. Nothing else. What did I use my PSP for? Launch ver or launch titles that were unique, like Luminous, and ports of games that I already owned. I, I would say the same thing, although I can narrow down the ports of games that are available on other systems to I used my PSP to play Tony Hawk, Pro Tony Hawk Underground 2 Remix, and I played like 500 hours of Tony Hawk Underground 2 Remix. I like that game a lot. You could go to Japan and you could spin around on those po those poles where you put in coins when you have to park. Parking meters, that's what they're called. I live in a town that is not super urban, so I don't even know what a parking meter is. Unless I'm playing it in Tony Hawk Underground 2 Remix. I have to take back what I said about the Xbox dashboard update. There is a new feature in scare quotes, uh, Internet Explorer for Xbox. So, Hooray. last I heard is that was gold only, and I think that's still the case, but that exists now if you are a crazy bad person and you want to use Internet Explorer on your Xbox. It I don't... <laughs> I guess I'll have to try and contain my excitement. Yep. So I just received a gun in Borderlands 3 that does 4,682 damage. Well, hold it's the pistol. presses, because there's been a new Borderlands named Borderlands 3, apparently. Yep, it's awesome. <laughs> Sen is, like, super ahead of the curve because he's industry. They sent him a review also, copy. Also, spi Spider Overlords. Nice. No, I'm just broadcasting from the future. I'm living in a bunker under the sea. So what's the gun? It is the Redundant Fibber. It consumes two ammo per shot, has plus 50% love, and plus 3,000% damage. Plus 50% love? Yep. I, I, that sounds alright. Oh, right. I get it. I want, I I'm want sorry, more love. I just, fi I just figured this out. Its stats are a complete lie. <laughs> Damn you, Borderlands, and your sense of humor. <laughs> no, the the joke is an absolute that lie, and it has none of these stats. That's hilarious. You just figured that out with a name like that? Yes. He's a bit slow, isn't he? A little bit. Although... I'm sorry, I just got really excited about having a pistol that shoots more powerful than a rocket launcher. Uh, I want the stats to be real. I want my gun to shoot love. 50% more love. 
<laughs> it, it shoots additional percentage love from the love it previously shot, which was zero. So, yeah. you know, 150% of zero. Yep, that is how this works. Yeah, I'm still having super amounts of fun on my uh, assassin character. Still totally a great game to play. So, have you purchased the Season Pass, or do you think you're going to purchase the Captain Scarlet DLC? I will purchase Captain Scarlet and probably the Season Pass to get it, uh, most likely when War Machine Weekend is over. But until then, all of my money is reserved for having an awesome uh, tournament. That seems sensible. I think my strategy, especially seeing as how I have not beaten the core game yet, will be to wait until more of the DLC is available to determine what kind of value the season pass is. Yeah, I I genuinely need to see where the ending leaves me, because I might up, end up in the situation that I'm at with, uh, with Mass Effect 3. I have utter respect for the DLC they're putting out, but I just don't feel the need to play it, because I have closure for that game. Uh-huh. I have almost always been a I don't particularly go back into games to play DLC unless it's super exceptional like say Mass Effect 2 Shadow Broker but I was uh, musing the other day that Ubisoft has actually kind of done me a solid with the Assassin's Creed series by the fact that they never release it on time on PC so what has actually happened is that by the time it comes out on PC the DLC is already out so I just get it integrated into my experience for free. It's like, oh. I guess that sort of makes up for the fact that you cannot release your games on time, you jerks. Yeah. Uh, Borderlands 2 DLC will get played by me on the condition that I have not already beaten the game when it comes out. I think the Captain Scarlet is not a decider either way. I think this is a very slight, minor portion of what will be their larger DLC roadmap. I'm sure the other things will be way bigger than this. But for what it is, it seems pretty cool. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that Scarlet is going to pretty much be the equivalent to, like, Do uh, Dr. Ned's was, where it's, yeah, this is a small area that has kind of a gimmick to it, and that is it. Yeah. See, my... I'm, I'm going back to this Pokemon thing again, I know. We return to the Pokemon. I, well, I'm still trying to pick a starter, and what's what's killing me is, like, if I go with Tepig again, I'm going to go from having three weaknesses, rock, ground, and water, for being a fire type, to, with that second typing, I'm going to have four. Wow. Four is a lot of weaknesses. Flying, psychic, ground, and water. And those seem to be bit more common, too. I have had a bit of a revelation just now about the nature of the Argo poster. Mm -hmm. There is a plot point in the movie that revolves around the reassembling of a shredded document, and I, I didn't notice before, but the poster is, it's got these black vertical lines on it, and that's because it's a reassembled shredded document. Oh, snap. I must say, one of the things, it is always true in period pieces that the plot would fall apart if they had cell phones, but the plot would also fall apart in this case if they had cross-cut shredders. Because it's like, come on. My shredder is cross-cut, and it was, like, really cheap. These are CIA shredders, and they only cut vertically? lame -o. Apparently the CIA, CIA are not known for buying quality paper shredders. I'm considering Oshawa this time around, actually. I like that idea. Uh, just staying away from the good one, huh? Okay, you realize this gives you a competitive advantage. I have my preferred Pokemon. Also, why would you want me to have the same Pokemon as you? Because it's amazing. Snivy for the audience that is too lazy to look it up. Admittedly, you know, it's, you know, the, I like the reptile look of it. Aesthetically, that is appealing, but... Snivy is kind of cute, but I don't think I would pick him as my starter. <laughs> cute in a hyper-pompous sort of way. Yeah. I don't know. Let me take a look at its evolution tree. It just gets more pompous. It, it doesn't actually evolve. It just gets more pompous as it goes. So, yeah. Snivy, snivy. There you are. While we're looking up Pokemon stuff. Yeah, I, I've i determined I will not buy another Pokemon game until I have cleared Pokemon, uh, the first Pokemon Black. Yeah. It kind of sucks, because 
I am I am like almost at the threshold where I would buy a 3DS and play Pokemon on it, and I am almost at the threshold where I would buy a Vita and play Assassin's Creed Liberation on it. But it's like all of both of those just need a slight push to push me over the edge. If only I could play them both on one platform. Well, to be fair, Capcom kind of made me not want a uh, a Vita just because I'm still angry about the thing that they did with uh, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. On disc DLC, that is. On disc DLC, that is unlocked for free only if you buy a second version of a game that you already own. I'm sorry, that is garbage. It looks like Oshawa has better base stats. This just in, Oshawa has better base stats. Oshawa, cuter. Yeah, Samurott, not so much. No. Well, that has always been the case with Pokemon, is I have a deep place in my heart for Squirtle, and it's like Squirtle, at his first evolution, starts... You know what? Blastoise is awesome. Wardwordle sucks. Yeah, Blastoise is awesome. Blastoise is, like, old and grizzled, so it's like, yeah, you look like... You look like somebody who's seen the world, whereas Warthoidal is like, I'm just a jerk. It's like frilly enough that it's not badass, and yet like angular enough that it's not cute anymore. I don't know, there's just so much going on wrong with that aesthetically. Yep. Yeah, I like, uh... Hmm. I might just pick up Duat and or like pick up Oshawott, get it to its second evolution tier, and then leave it there. That seems like a reasonable strategy. It's actually pretty beneficial in Pokemon to not evolve Pokemon sometimes. Yeah, I know you and Pixie do that, but frankly I just let the damn things evolve the moment they're ready. They're yeah, like, but then you don't have good move sets. Well no, I just have to wait longer for them. Or use TMs or yeah, TMs, because HMs aren't good moves, but... I'm sure somebody will, you know, write in to correct us on that. Wait, we have uh, people who listen? Crap. Well, we actually... Pixie was telling me that we need to have more League of Legends content on the show because we had multiple people who were uh, interacting with us talking about League of Legends stuff last show. Really? Yep. <laughs> oh, yes, man, do we so... just... Do we need to be the replacement League of Legends podcast? Because, like, all of those have gone away recently. I see nothing I wrong with that. I guess we do, because clearly it Welcome brings all the to Nerd Talk, to the yard. The absolute most amateur League of Legends podcast in existence. The other thing I was thinking is that I downloaded LOL Recorder, and because I don't have any video to put behind the podcast when it goes up on YouTube, I was just going to playback league matches and put them underneath the podcast with no context and not being related to anything. It's like, hey, here's some visual interest that you're not even going to have in this, you're not going to have this tab on your screen. You're this realistically... is the part where I turret dive an entire team as jacks and win. I only have one replay recorded right now and I was playing Pantheon uh, uh, versus beginner bots because it was free week and I was playing him for the first time. And Pantheon's ultimate ability, Grand Skyfall, which I call Mandrop, is basically a teleport with damage. And I <laughs> the like half naked Mandrop. Yep, I like to use it to drop into deep enemy territory without any heed for my own safety. So it's like, yeah, I'll just appear between the enemy's nexus turrets when like all of the outer turrets are still up. No worries. <laughs> yep. That that's a Pantheon thing. He does that. Oh, if you're watching the video version of this podcast, you may even be able to see that. Pantheon's man drop. Sounds awkward. If you're listening to this on WLRA, then go to nerdtalkshow.com, and yeah, there you'll be able to see the video it's pretty version. Sniffy. So did you ever play much 3v3, Sen? Yeah, that's currently what my ranked team is. Huh. The team that is struggling to uh, achieve war hero Janna, because it is a fully clothed Janna skin... Woo! What do you have to do That's to right. earn that? You have to be a gold-ranked player, which is the top 10% of the game. Everyone else, Janna, doesn't get pants. <laughs> so are you excited about the changes to Twisted Treeline? I was surprised to hear that the jungle mobs were randomized. I didn't know that until I'm, you just told me. I'm frankly just really excited that Riot is paying attention to a version of the game 
besides the ever popular Summoner's Rift. Right. I, I love League of Legends as a game, and I think the more variety you can create, the better that game is going to be in the long run. I agree. Like, focusing on Summoner's Rift as the one and only mode is silly. The other thing that I would really want Riot to add, that is sort of just a minor tweak on their existing formats, is I want bots to be available on the Proving Grounds map. Because... The Murder Bridge, as it's known? Yes. When I'm... I have set up a couple of bot matches, and I used one to get a Teemo to 100 kills, just to, and then I stacked, like, four Trin Forces, just to see what would happen. Did it all inside of 30 minutes, because beginner bots are so dumb. And then... Beginner players are so dumb, like... I'm going to get looked down on this, but I actually made a Twink account when I was basically committed to the idea of I will play Diana and only Diana to get extremely good as her. But to do that, I'm going to exclusively practice against new players. Because by that point, summoner spells don't matter as much since there's no flash. Uh, your runes aren't there. Like, I thought it was a good idea at the time, until I realized just how much of a difference there is between skill levels in this game. Even without runes or summoner spells, the yeah, basic just, knowledge of positioning and when to dive or not dive or what, exactly. how grass that, works. That if, difference was so great that, like, it wasn't even fair for me to be playing, and so I immediately abandoned that idea. I admit that it was a fair while into my League of Legends career before I understood how grass worked and knew what the terms AP and AD stood for. So Yeah, and you'd think that there would be a good explanation of that in-game, like a little, hey, here's the terms that we use in this game, but no, there, there's nothing of the sort, in fact. Nope. And, and that's the unfortunate thing about League of Legends. I think it would really benefit Riot to, like, say, hire someone specifically to program a an introduction section. Well, they kind of have added more of one of that since a lot of people started playing, and it explains... I, I think they need a lot more. They do need a lot more. Like, there needs to be a proper tactics summary. Yeah. Just a, hey, here's how this works, here's what these teams are, and while a lot of people would argue that, well, that would only enforce one style of meta, you don't have to. Like, you could genuinely program that so that it just explained that, well, these two things kind of work together well. You should consider the idea of giving your support player uh, the AD carry, or the AD character, because this is what they can do, and this is why it's good to have them. Uh-huh. And if even if it does homogenize the meta for beginner players, it's obvious that the upper tier would never. It, it's stay a lot better than just letting them run free to do whatever they want, and then when they hit a certain point in their gaming, they have no idea what's going on and likely are a hindrance to their team. Right, and then the other thing is that that's bad for Riot because they keep losing, and then they don't want to play anymore. <laughs> or when, you know, some jerk makes a low-level account to practice a specific character or just to be a jerk, they end up, uh, the new players end up not having fun because they're just getting beaten into uh, submission by those other players. Yep. Like, I, I still don't think Riot can find an accurate solution to the, the twinking issue. Because there's nothing you can do about it. You can't punish people for making multiple accounts. You just make the win ramp really fast so that if you keep doing really good, then you level quickly. Yeah, I, I think that's the solution. And so, like, the three games that I played were just so tilted that I was like, nope, not fair, and had to abandon the idea. I, I was literally ending those games feeling terrible about doing it. So, despite not having any overt advantage, my play skill was to the point where it was like, Wow, that that team didn't actually stand any chance. And that's not the feeling I want my opponents to have. Right. If I completely dominate the enemy team, I want it to be because they had an equal chance as me, and I just outplayed them. 
Ah, well. Anything else? I don't think so, and I think we've got an hour in right now. Perfect. All right. So, in the meantime, uh, she's Pixie playing next. Pokemon. <laughs> coming up next, more stuff on Pokemon, probably. Um, <laughs> I'm Sen playing Borderlands two and three. At and the I'm Pyro Sim being a professional and not playing video games while I do the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean next week. What are we doing? That's what I'm getting at. Uh, uh, whatever my schedule allows for. <laughs> that is a deep mystery. I'd say that Operation Never Sleep Ever is well underway for me and shows no signs of slowing down. XCOM and Dishonored still are at the top of the zeitgeist, and in fact, I would like to play Mark of the Ninja now that it's available for Steam. Yes, that looks super cool. Actually, let's call it Mark of the Ninja, because that's a relatively small, cheap indie game. I'll, I'll see if I can fit in some Mark of the Ninja. Next week, we are in fact marking ninjas. Yep, with spray paint. Would that mean that we're tagging them? Yes. We are adding metadata so that we can search for ninjas more easily. Because <laughs> you want to be able to easily find your ninjas. I don't want them to be disorganized, disheveled mess. Anyway, uh, so I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Pyrosim. And Pyrosim and I will catch you at the top of the hour. And welcome back to Nerd Talk Pyro. Are you with us? Yes, I am. All right, so Pyrosim had a little bit of a... Um, hiccup, I guess, and we weren't getting a very good signal, but hopefully that'll be better now. Fingers crossed. As yep. I say, if you're not phone, counting on... The old-fashioned phone network has problems. It doesn't usually work very well. I would try and move to a more internet-based solution when we can, but not always possible. Um, so... Here's the, okay, so why don't you finish what you were saying about Apple here? I'll start from the top. So, there are some pretty strong rumors indicating that Apple is going to release a 7-inch mobile device called the iPad Mini, or potentially the iPad Air. The name is still disputed, but it is pretty clear that they're going to actually make the product. Uh, Apple and Steve Jobs in particular had made some fairly derisive statements about the 7-inch format before, saying that it is not a comfortable size to use because you can't use your thumb to get all the way across the screen, but you'd have to use both hands, and it's not super big, so you don't get the advantage of the huge screen. But with the introduction of the Kindle Fire, the Nexus 7, and to some extent the Nook tablet, that relatively low price points, like all of those are 200 and those having massive success in the market, Apple has decided it wants a piece of the pie. Oh, one thing that is interesting about this is that the current iPad has a 30-pin connector on the bottom of it, and the 30-pin connector is essentially a dead format because... The iPhone 5 doesn't use it, and you can bet that the next iPad won't use it either. So, introducing a whole new product category almost serves as a stopgap for if somebody is buying an Apple tablet, they don't have a full year where the Apple tablet that is available does not have the current connector without having to, you know, rush out an iPad 4 only a few months after the, quote, new iPad, which is officially named the new iPad and not the iPad 3, which is, you know, the kind of thing that makes people not like Apple very much. Come on, that is... It is okay if you name a Saints Row game a crazy name, but you shouldn't name a consumer electronics product a crazy name because that makes it very hard to talk about. I guess realistically, everybody just calls it the iPad 3 and ignores the official name. I choose to make fun of it because that's novel. But yeah, uh, iPad mini, 7-inch, or actually 8, more like 8 inches. So slightly larger than the 
dominant Android tablets. Um, probably a cheaper price point than the full-size iPads. Uh, maybe even dramatically cheaper. We don't know yet because it's not available. But it is not necessarily true that uh, it would be cheaper for Apple to manufacture a smaller device, but it is likely that they will shrink their margins in order to fit consumer expectations that 7-inch devices are closer to 200 than $600. And so I guess if you are a consumer interested in an Apple tablet, this could just be an opportunity to get a better value for your money. I personally... What I want out of a device is for it to be as big as possible while I can still carry it around because with a big device, you get the advantages of it is really nice to set on a table and show YouTube videos to other people. It is really nice to um, be able to type on if you have the unfortunate displeasure of typing long pieces of text on a capacitive screen and you get the huge battery life of simply having a device with more surface area. I actually took that to an extreme by using a 10 inch tablet, the original Motorola zoom as my only device for maybe even two years, at least a full year. And that was because I was crazy. But the only real deficiency with that, besides the fact that it didn't make proper phone calls, was the fact that it was very difficult to carry around because it wouldn't fit in a pants pocket, obviously, but it wouldn't even fit in, like, the chest pocket of a hoodie. Like, you can't, you can't put this anywhere. You have to have a backpack or nothing. A 7-inch device is a nice compromise. Not as much as the Galaxy Note 2, which is actually slated to be announced in U.S. versions. It's already out internationally. But it'll be announced in U.S. versions on October 24th, less than a week from now. I think that will be a 5.5-inch device, which, according to reviewers, you can put in a pants pocket, or at least a dude's pants pocket, probably not a lady's pants pocket because they are not tailored sanely or the same. What lady's pants pockets? I mean, <laughs> okay. okay. I'm going to have like a mini rant here that there's a special circle in hell for whoever decides to make decorative butt flaps and not add the rest of the pocket because honestly, why? It's like, we want to pretend for people who are looking at your butt that you have the capacity to store things there. But if you actually have an item that you need to transport, no, no, we are not going to facilitate that. That would be crazy. That is, that is no bueno. Uh, anyway, so shall I get into some new game releases since that's the thing? Ooh, um, please do. There's one in particular I was kind of looking forward to. Uh, coming out within the next month, and that is a 3DS title. Oh my goodness, they actually make those? Uh, d yes, it's just a problem getting them to, you know, release them in North America. Anyway, so this one, um, already out in Japan. So the North American release, uh, Harvest Moon 3D, A New Beginning, will be out here in the States uh, November 6th. Woo. Europe and Australia don't even like have Harvest Moon dates games. determined, so good luck with that, guys. Uh, I, I do have a soft spot in my heart for Harvest Moon games. Uh, particularly, God, I can never remember the name of it, but I have fond memories as a child of playing it on the GameCube back in the day. You and I have made a concerted effort to try and determine which version it was that you had played and it proved somewhat difficult for the reason that there are simply a billion Harvest Moon games for there are every so platform. many. It was a, one, uh, a Wonderful Life, something like that. And the, the, the subtitles, of course, mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. They it's have just, no relevance to the particular variations they, of that. They, game they don't mean anything as far as like any kind of 
plot or what the game does. It's just here's some you know pleasant sounding nonsense. Harvest Moon, Eagle Monkey Banana. Basically, just don't think about all those things at once. That's how you kill yourself with your mind. Wow. People who are very confused, go listen to the entire archive of the Rooster Teeth podcast. Because that would take It was a forever. joke in there at one point. <laughs> anyway, so... It will only take, like, 180 hours. It's not bad. So this is coming out within the next month. I would like to play this. Um, if for no other reason, then, you know, it's a 3DS title. And, gosh, I need something to play on that. Yep. Um, but Do you are... have any inclination as to if it will have multiplayer, or if any Harvest Moon games have ever had multiplayer? Gosh, I think there was some kind of connecting thing on the Game Boy Advance versions, as far as, like, ever having a thing. But I don't uh, happen to know off the top of my head if this one will. Um, might want to check out the Amazon page, see if there's anything on it there. Uh, there are some new features in this one. Um, they're adding a couple new animals yaks and llamas specifically and you've got a couple new crops cacti and cotton um i suppose i should explain for those who for some reason aren't familiar with the harvest moon games uh they're i guess kind of farm simulators sort of it's they're they're very japanese i don't know how else to describe them um you play as you know your hero or heroine at some games didn't let you to determine your character's gender like i remember the gamecube version didn't this one um a big emphasis is on customization so not only do you pick if you're male or female you're gonna pick you know everything down to what you look like you can change your clothes and hairstyle and there's a salon now in the town and so a big emphasis is on customization you can now um determine where certain buildings go on your farm and what they're going to look like and move your crops around so a lot a lot of emphasis is going on determining what things look like this is all aesthetics basically but you know whatever i like dollies <laughs> that is kind of a lot of the value of harvest moon games they're not well they even are kind of difficult in certain times but yeah. they're it's like it's it's just you are running a farm like you start with basically nothing and then you go like gather up some seeds and you farm some stuff and you sell things and like you know you've got chickens they lay eggs you've got a cow it makes milk stuff like that then you bring your stuff to market and try and sell it to the local townsfolk and you make nice with the townsfolk and each of them have like different stuff going on it sounds incredibly boring but i guess I don't know. There's just and then certain... you flirt with the librarian, and the librarian wears his heart on his sleeve. Like, literally, there is a love indicator shaped like a heart that is on his arm. Um, and then you get married. Yeah, the, there's the, this time around. There, there's always the, a recurring theme in Harvest Moon games is there's, you know, several eligible, you know, bachelorettes or bachelors, depending on, you know, which um, gender your protagonist is playing as. Um, having a female protagonist is kind of a new thing in very recent iterations, so. Obviously, I like doing that. But I think uh, amongst the eligible ladies in town, I've always been the librarian has been my choice. Anyway. So, I I don't see a, I don't see a librarian option here. Dang it. I can't play this game. Not playing a 3DS anymore. Go. I mean, you might like the journalists in there on either side. Hey, okay, I'm back in. <laughs> All right, I'm linking you to the Wikipedia article. Anyway. Excellent. So you've got, you know, different bachelors to choose from, and basically they've each got, you know, different personalities, obviously, and that'll... Um, but a big long-standing thing about this franchise is, you know, you're going to pick one of these, and then, you know, chapters are going to progress get married, have child, child inherits farm, and scene. Um, <laughs> but a new feature in the 3DS version is that you're going to, you know, need to, like, you're going to need to go from, like, chatting them up to actually dating them before you get to using a blue feather to propose because that's apparently a tradition in these games is that people propose by offering each other blue feathers 
It's very weird. So what's 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 going to what's going to happen is, and I'm going to quote you this bullet point from the Wikipedia article because it is written so. Well, I'll, I'll let you uh, I'll let you hear this. Players will date the bachelor or bachelorette that they are after first. They will give them a ring and start to date them. The blue feather is still used to propose, like traditional in Harvest Moon games. So first, you decide to date them and you give them a ring, and then when you want to get married, you give them a feather. This seems a little weird to me, but who am I to, you know, knock whatever Harvest Moon culture? TV Tropes has a term to describe what basically the whole Harvest Moon franchise is, and that is widget, spelled W-J-T, a weird Japanese thing. It's a widget. All right, then. Uh, Apparently your I cats, like your pet cats and dogs get fat if they are not cared for properly now. Because that was truly missing. That, it really wasn't. Uh, Let me tell you about real life cats. They get fat. Fat cats. Then you can take pictures of them and put them on Reddit for massive karma. Yay. Honestly, that seems to be, like, the big draw of this game is the... You are going to, like, customize and tweak lots of things. There's a lot, lot of emphasis in this game on pretty dress-up. Um, so, hairdressers, tailors, and um, changing the layout of your farm buildings and stuff. That seems to be the big draw. Don't know much about it, honestly. You know what kind of vibe I'm getting from you describing it as a dress-up simulator? Mm -hmm. Is it almost sounds like a single-player offline version of Gaia Online, or at least the game elements of Gaia Online. That, that kind of makes sense. That interesting to me. That kind of makes sense as a descriptor, I'm going to be honest. There's less less emphasis on... Um, I mean, the the core thing is the, like, running your farm. Like... Right. Kind of reseteer ish. But only from like the uh -huh. business end. Um So that's that's been like the that and the like, you know, wooing one of the eligible bachelors or bachelorettes. Those have been like the core components of every Harvest Moon game. So like me, I like, you know, I I run mostly ranches, so I mine are mostly animal based. Moo. Um, Cute cows. Basically, lots and lots of cows and sheep and stuff like that. Um, and Harvest Moon chickens don't scare me nearly as much as real ones do. Real chickens are scary. Birds frighten me. I'm, are... I am not going to lie. Mean and dumb and they'll peck at you. Get away, chickens. So, yeah. I think it is interesting that, that, at least written in English in this Wikipedia article, there is a bachelor named Sanjay who is described as being from far away. And I wonder if the in the original Japanese it was an Indian person who was from far away. Because it seems like that wouldn't be so exotic in Japan. That'd just be like a Canadian to an American. That's not... Well, it's, a, it's more distant than that, but is you're on the right continent and not the wrong continent. Well, has um, to be like an Australian. Sunday's employer, Australian. Amir, um, is described as a foreign prince. That's actually a returning character from another Harvest Moon DS game, Grand Bazaar. So, call back to that. Um, if you are familiar with Harvest Moon games, there's a lot of that to be had in, like, a lot of the titles are very cross-referential, but not in a way that's going to, I think, mean much or do anything for someone who isn't, like, I am not one of those, like, hardcores, like, everything about these franchises buy every game and play it to 100% completion types. It's just, yeah, I had some fun with this, like once or twice and I guess I'll pick it up again kind of thing so Harvest Moon and Animal Crossing have a similar place in my heart that is that level of devotion 
it's like, well, this is kind of super casual and it's cute and I like it. Basically. This is fun. So I like the idea of being able to, you know, take it with me. That appeals to me because that's very much a like, I've got 10 minutes, I guess I'll milk some cows or something. That's, that's, I guess that's totally. going to be like kind of my hold me over while um, Animal Crossing jump out refuses to come out anytime this year yes. or for the last two years. No software for portable systems. That is the curse. Indeed. At least not in North America. Do you know if there's any particular region locking on the 3DS? Like, I actually, how theoretically possible is it to import a Japanese copy? Oh, and what? And, play it's, it in and, Japanese? and see if I can read it? Yep. Um, you know, I'm not sure. If the actually, that might locked. work well in the context of an Animal Crossing or a Harvest Moon, where you already know the mechanics, because they're the same mechanics as previous versions for the large part. And even when there are new mechanics, you don't necessarily need to do a lot of reading. You can sort of parse things out when you need to, but you don't have to be completely fluent in order to be able to play the game. The suspicion I have is that it is completely region locked because that is sort of the default. But the PS3 is strangely not globally region locked, so maybe. maybe uh, yes, the 3DS is season. region locked. Of course. A quick Google confirms this. Yep. So that's unfortunate. I just want to play your games. You won't release them in North America, and you won't even let me buy the Japanese versions and play them in Japanese. What is wrong with you? So what I would this is my money. <laughs> what I, I would to have to games. do at that point is buy a Japanese console and then import the game that way. And that sounds expensive and time-consuming. Very expensive. So, yeah, not going to happen. Anyway, um, do we have anything else to say on Harvest Moon or 3DS things before I move on? Nope. Alrighty then. Uh, so, uh, next on my radar, at least, is uh, the Sims 3 expansion pack Seasons. I didn't pick up Supernatural. I just, I don't know, didn't appeal to me all that much. Like, no. it's it's kind of, and you would think this would be strange for me, but I don't particularly like the weird stuff in The Sims. Like, I like the right. weird but kind of plausible, like, the constant references to llamas and stuff. Like, that's fine. Like, the supernatural, like, mm, implausible things, those are, uh, right, and don't appeal to me all that much. Like, I don't particularly want, like, like, I've got no problem with there being vampires in my game. But I don't even play any. I'm just like, oh, these are just things that exist in my reality, I guess. But I, I, I feel like I feel like kind of my um, obsessive dollhouse crafting would be kind of diminished if it was. Oh well, I've got magic powers now. The, the challenge is yeah, gone is from trying to you know. Almost like playing with cheat codes in a way. Yes. And I mean, I guess there are certain challenges to deal with in each of those scenarios, but I kind of play the Sims franchise from the standpoint of trying to maximize the human condition, if that makes yeah. any sense. Like, these are going to be the best that they can be on their own merit. That is a very interesting way to play it, and I have gotten... You and I have collaborated on some sims insofar as, you know, just making the decisions that you make the, with their job and choosing what kind of characteristics they should have. Well, one in particular named Samantha, that you got up pretty early to having maxed skills in all of the categories. Mm -hmm. My favorite sim ever. Yeah, she was pretty great, like, Samantha Cho. She, uh, 
she had all of the available skill trees maxed out by the time she was a teenager, and it was great. <laughs> this one particular character sticks out to me because it's a simulation. It's These are actually kind of people inside this universe. And the vampires and the aliens sort of diminishes that. Yeah, like, you know, they, they feel less like characters and more like toys the more of that, like, paranormal, extraneous stuff you add. So I, I like the expansions that add more dimension to the characters and the narratives that I have built, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, for example, I bought the Generations Pack because that added more interest to certain stages of life that I would typically try and speed through because they weren't particularly compelling from a gameplay standpoint. And so by adding more stuff to do to, like, the toddler and child and even elder stages, then, you know, I was like, okay, I'm getting more out of this. So, of course, I was going to buy those. Um, uh -huh. Similarly, we've got The Sims 3 Seasons coming out November 13th. So that's also less than a month away. Now, I really enjoyed the Sims 2 Seasons expansion pack. So even if this is just basically that only on the Sims 3 engine, I would be reasonably happy with that, actually. But it looks like there are some there's some extra stuff. I mean, yes, there is weather. Um, and the weather is more dimensional than simply rain and snow and sun. Um, there are five types of weather in The Sims 3 Seasons. You get um, rain, lightning, sunny, hail, snow, and fog. And you get varying degrees of rain, like light rain or lightning storms or... Uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, wind has been added as an element. Um... Is there any Katy Perry branding on this expansion? Doesn't appear to be, no. And I think I'm okay with that. Hooray. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put hooray as my stamp for that. Nothing against Katy Perry, but it's like I'm not sure she belongs in The Sims. Yeah, that seems like a really weird tie-in to me. And, well, I didn't much buy into it. Uh, there's going to be a limited edition, which includes some exclusive items. But it's basically ice themed furniture that I can live without, I think. Uh huh. Unless I basically want to build the Penguin's Lair or Spider Man's Fortress That's of Solitude. I have a screenshot of Samantha in her teenager state watching TV outside in the snow. It's really. <laughs> because there was no room really inside of the small house for me to put the tv and the couch and so i put it outside and then with the expansion pack it snowed but there wasn't actually any consequences for leaving electronics in the snow so <laughs> she would just go outside and sit on the snow covered couch and shiver and watch tv in the snow didn't seem to be bothered terribly much honestly no not really it was just like to us viewers, it seemed a little strange, but the Sims were, like, hunky-dory. Yeah, it's just like, uh, I guess that there's, like, a fine white over everything, but they didn't express any actual discomfort. They've added holidays and festivals to this expansion. So there are four holidays. Love Day, Spooky Day, Snowflake Day, and Leisure Day. You think you can guess what oh, those man. all correspond to? Those are definitely not, like, obvious analogs for any real world holidays hey, that's definitely not valentine's day halloween christmas like holiday winter holiday season and uh possibly labor day i guess to be that last one yeah i guess leisure day is not the is the one that isn't super obvious but i would have called it labor day too yeah don't wear white after leisure day <laughs> all holidays take place on the last friday of every season if there is no Friday, it will take place on the last day of the season. Um, there's a festival held in each season, which is apparently separate from the holiday. Uh, not a whole lot of information here on this, to be honest. 
There is a certain aspect in the marketing of The Sims expansion wherein they don't need to promote them very much because there is a core audience that will buy just about any Sims expansion without any information about what it's going to contain. Yeah. And then Still, those like discerning it. consumers amongst us have to dig to find the information. We are the smaller market. Yeah. So lots of decorative stuff. Obviously, people like to holiday decorate. And so giving people a context to do that inside of their uh, virtual dollhouses, obviously a big winner. In fact, I imagine that if it hasn't already, the uh, EA's online store, I can't remember the what they're calling it, um, has probably or will soon explode with holiday-themed stuff for people to spend their EA points on. Definitely. Can I just say that is the one thing I that if if I were to pick one thing from this current generation of consoles from like the last what was it ten years or so that like just annoys me to probably unreasonable levels is the points thing that you buy points and then the points are traded for stuff or digital goods as that it were. That's really the one thing that just really why don't annoys you just let me, me pay to pay for things with the money. I, I just why can't I just look at it, you tell me how much it is in real dollars, and then I give you real dollars, and then you give me the thing, like we have for, you know, the entire history of, like, e economics everywhere ever. One of the foundational principles of society is money in exchange for things, and then it's like... It's like, that, we had, had a pretty good system going on, and you guys had to screw it up. You added this system for no good reason. At least not any reason that I, I, I can understand consumers. the, like, hypothetical reason being that, like, oh, well, points don't translate into the brain as dollars. It's, like, the same reason, like, stores mark things to, like, you know, fifty nine ninety nine instead of 60. Like, it's a psychological thing right. meant to screw with you, and the points don't translate into dollars in your brain, and therefore you're going to be more willing to spend whatever thousand points... If you can't figure out that, but even you that know. is kind of offensive because it's like the game companies want to take money from consumers without giving them additional value, and it's like the other reason that it, they it want adds to a stupid extra because. step on my end that I have to think about, and I'm just like, I I just want to buy things. That's it. Like I want to yeah. buy things from you. Really, you make me a thing I like, and I will buy it. But I don't want to have to, like, do a whole bunch of conversions and go to a separate area of the store, put points onto my account, and then go back and try and figure out what it was I was trying to buy. Because I don't keep, and I'm sure that's probably another reason, too, is that, you know, you're buying the points, so therefore you're making, you're making basically that gift card style of commitment to buying something later that they get to sit on your money for. And if you don't spend all of those points, exactly. oh well. But... Like, that just adds an extra step to the process for me. And as you very well know, adding extra steps costs a lot of online business. That's like, well, like, I'm not going to do this transaction at all if you're going to make it difficult. Basically. If it was easy, I would have already been done with it by now, but I got to go. So um, you don't get any money at all. Yeah, it's like those sites and that make you sign up for accounts in order to make a single transaction with them. It's like you and I both know full well I'm never coming. Business. It's you and I both know I'm never coming back here. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. Ugh. So there's, yeah. there's an even worse scenario with those points wherein you want to buy a particular product, but you cannot buy exactly that many points. You have to buy a card that has more points than that. And if you have no interest in buying other products on this service, then you just have to pay more for this product straight up. That's like, well, this is 800 points, but I can only buy 500 point or 1,000 point cards. So I am. I run into that a lot, actually. On um, With Microsoft points on Xbox Live, I run into that a lot. It's like, oh, well, I was only looking to buy this one thing, but now I have to buy more points than I actually need. And so I usually end up having, like, a few points left over on my account that aren't enough to buy anything. They just sit there. Then the next thing Which comes out that I want to buy, and then I've got to buy more points. Money. 
But as far as the consumer is concerned, hey, you're stealing money from me, you jerks. So, yeah, not the biggest fan of that. We really don't have a whole lot to go on on this expansion, which is kind of surprising. Usually I've got, like, a great big list I get to run down full of all the shiny new features. But I guess since they did just turn out, what was it, a month ago? Not even. Um, The Sims 3 Supernatural. That was a bit of a big deal there. (laughs) Shane is waving at me through the window here at the station. And... (laughs) I don't know. Hi, Shane. So, yeehaw, me kick ass. Go on in. Hey, Shane, how you doing? Hey. Yep. Totally on. I was so, just, uh, I was just discussing um, the BS that is buying points to make transactions for online goods and services. Oh yeah, like Microsoft points yes. and all that. No, <laughs> I, I was listening as I was driving around, and I was wondering how can there not be a f- last Friday of a season. For the, uh, for the sim stuff? <laughs> I, I'm quoting you like, verbatim. <laughs> it, it, I heard that and I'm going, wait, how can there not be a last Friday? It just happens like a week beforehand. I don't know. It's, maybe their calendar works differently. Uh, <laughs> it's Sims I logic. it depends on your Sims age flight or no your sense game. That's why Sometimes the season will be shorter than a week. But I, f- I figured I'd just stop in and ask you that. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, thanks for dropping by, Yeehaw. <laughs> All right, and there he goes. <laughs> well, that was nice of him to drop by. We'll actually Absolutely. be heading up together to the Galloping Ghost Arcade to do some filming for a news package, which will air, I think, next week. Woo. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's next week or the week after. Better watch constantly just to make sure. And or follow Pixie's Twitter at NerdTalkPixie. You might also like our Facebook they page. At Facebook.com slash NerdTalk. <laughs> anyway, you were saying? Yeah, the, the sense of time has always been screwed up in The Sims because... Yeah, it's the, like... Well, I mean, think about it. The is that days are years because Sims typically live to be something like 80 days long by default. Ex- except... If you think about it, they don't transition to adult at 18 days. They just don't. And um, right. it's, it's more like, you know, in, in their 20s. And also, basically, Sims go through... You, you've got a gestation period on Sims now. Where, you know, in, like, Sims 1 era, you, you used to, you know, basically go, we're going to have a baby, and then a freaking carriage just spawns there at their feet. Um there's actually a... They don't you know, even have to spin around. It just shows up. There was, Modern Sims have it rough. They have to spin. <laughs> they have to turn around in place and, like, basically do jazz hands. And then a baby shows up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very festive uh, birthing process. Anyway. Um, but there's, you know, there's a pregnancy period in The, in the Sims 3. And each the day basically counts for a trimester sim spent three days pregnant and then baby so how does your years analog work there unless it's like you're pregnant pregnant for three the equivalent of three years no wonder they're so miserable yeah that's terrible i don't even think i don't even think elephants have that long of a gestation period nope But even if you use that longest possible conversion rate of one day corresponds to three months, it is conceivable that you could jump through a season in a single day or a few days or since since everything is crazy. Yeah, maybe it, it isn't maybe it isn't actually a full week. Maybe on it's a only day and end on a Thursday. Yeah, maybe it isn't actually a full like seven day week. Maybe it's like five days or something. Yeah. This is all this is and all pure. The other thing is that it's all adjustable depending on your game settings. Sims can live to be 80 days or 300 days or... Or like only 40. So it spans all scale. And I'm sure seasons would scale with them. Of course, this is all conjecture because they don't give us anything to go on. I was going to say that 
having just released Supernatural last month shouldn't be much of an excuse for the Sims expansion team to not be promoting properly, because releasing an expansion every month is like standard operating procedure for them. Sims games get lots of expansions. When they do delay them, though, it's, you know, generally for the purpose of... How do I want to put this? There's usually a whole bunch of stuff, even if it's just lots of little stuff. Not to be confused right. for the Sims stuff packs, which is just basically more items. I never, ever buy those. I've never bought them, and I never plan to, because, well... I can just, you know, download custom content, you know, made within the community for free. Yep. Because those are basically for the people who just cannot find any other way to get their money to EA. It's like, I, I need, I have all this money, and I'm just completely addicted to The Sims, and I need to get rid of the money. Yeah, EA kind of milks that thing for so much money. There's a certain core the Amazon pl the Amazon page has even fewer details. You were saying? There's a certain audience that buys every single thing, but if you're going to be smart, you have to kind of choose a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. There's so as, as I've mentioned, there are certain expansions for those that I just don't have interest in for whatever reason and don't ever pick up. I have... Anyway, I suppose we should move on to the... To the new releases that are coming out. New releases. Alright, so, what's coming out? 007 Legends is coming out. Ooh, hey. It is a James Bond game promoting the new Skyfall movie kind of relates to uh, various James Bond movies. It's not just Skyfall, but I think it builds up to the final mission, which is a scene out of Skyfall, which will maybe be a teaser for people who are really excited about the new James Bond movie. You know what else is coming out within a month? Epic Mickey. What's that? Oh, yeah, that game. That game. That game yeah, that will assuredly be very good based on the high quality of its predecessor. I suppose Epic we should... Epic was terrible. Yeah, we should, we should clarify that you're being sarcastic in case somebody, you know, misinterprets your dry wit for uh, sincerity. By Epic Mickey. That, that would be a terrible mistake. Please don't do that. That would be a tragedy. Oh, yeah. Aren't we due out for that... You know, Wii U thing to be coming out like holiday season. That's coming up. Uh, yeah, that should be in November sometime. Because yeah, I'm seeing a bunch of November 18th release dates for things like Zombie U. Then yeah, that's got to be the whole console release date. So I guess that's kind of a big deal. I have no interest in this. I don't know about you. I am thoroughly uninterested in it. Like, I have an interest as a PC gamer in the advancement of console hardware because developers develop for consoles, but the Wii U is kind of not even that. It is just competitive with PS3 and 360, and so it doesn't advance the state of the art any. Um, the Mass Effect uh, trilogy is being re-released in, like, a three-pack bundle. Um, so that'll get you, like, a new foil box with some art and stuff like that in case you you know missed out on one or one or the other of the games and you want to get the best possible ending in mass effect 3 you're still going to be able to play the multiplayer along with other people who play mass effect 3 stuff like that so if you have for whatever reason missed out on the mass effect trilogy that'll be a good way to get in on it cannot recommend that series highly enough it is as you put it in previous shows transcendent for the media and they are amazing i love those games um, so that'll be coming out November 6th. Also coming out November 6th is Halo 4. Kind of a big deal. That is a big deal. 
Jeff has expressed disinterest in Halo 4, but I am more optimistic about it than he is. So this will be the first one developed by 343 as opposed to Bungie. So that'll be interesting. I'm hearing very good things about it from the people who have managed to get their hands on it, whether at things like um, it is. RTX or whatever other conventions that they've been showing it off at. You were saying? It is funny how long it took for Bungie to get out of the Halo business because nominally they were finished with Halo and they disincorporated from Microsoft because they were, at the creation of Halo 3, a wholly owned subsidiary of Microsoft. And they were like, no, we're going to spin ourselves off. We're going to stop working on Halo and we're going to work on different projects. And then they were the lead developer on ODST and Reach and we're working on the multiplayer forever. I was like, they're only now actually getting out of the Halo business. But you know what kind of sells me on Halo? Com- and what has always sold me What's on that? Halo? Split screen. Freaking split screen. Split screen is the greatest, and every there should be a lot more of it on consoles. Because you want to sit on the couch with other people and play the game. That's what couches are for. It's it's there's just something that I deeply enjoy about having, you know, people I can play with and enjoy a game with in the same room as me. That is a very strong contributor to a game's experience. And that is the reason that we had such a good experience with Lego Star Wars. Despite the fact that the game is actually kind of mechanically awful, clunky and broken. Yep. Um it's I can, the, the the experience of being able to play it and I the, let's just say the let's play genre is kind of a poor substitute version of having you know good company experiencing the game with you as you're doing it. Right, because the commentary and the other mental insight into the game is very powerful, and that's what makes the let's play genre interesting. But if that insight and commentary is coming from somebody who is right next to you, who you have a personal relationship with and can interact with, then that is way more powerful. So, but Traveler's Tales has made a lot of Lego games that are all mechanically the same as that Lego Star Wars that we liked. And there is a new one, Lego Lord of the Rings, coming out on November 13th. Oh, new Lego game. Eh, I don't know. I haven't been in those since uh, Lego Harry Potter, I'm going to be honest. No, I think the trick with them is that they are all identical. The only thing that changes between them is the license. Yeah. I mean, that license allows for... I enjoy the cutscenes a lot. I like the little animations, and I like their, you know... They are very cute. cutesy, joking interpretations of that intellectual property is usually, you know, enjoyable. There's... A significant, there's significant credit to be given for just being amused by a game. And that sounds Absolutely. kind of redundant. That sounds almost like a tautology, doesn't it? But um, I don't know how else to put it. It's just sometimes, you know, we, we get kind of swept up in the, uh, say, the Mass Effect, the, like, big sweeping story that gives you all of the feels. And then you, you kind of forget that, you know, sometimes it's just, fun to just sit there and be like that's funny when he fell down there is a term in movies and it kind of does not even mean very much in it doesn't make sense the way it is expressed in movies but everybody understands what it means and that is popcorn movie you know it's it's light you come there and you you enjoy it but that's it's just what it is it's not more than that and none of that is very semantically deep, but like, you can infer from what I'm saying what I actually mean. It's, they're like simple amusing games. I think it is interesting that the cover art for Lego Lord of the Rings has front and center Aragorn and then it's got like Gandalf and Legolas behind him and then Frodo is like off in the corner is kind of tidy. They're like Hey, I'm the main character. Yeah, but you're not rugged and handsome like Legolas. 
and and Aragorn. So those two go up front. Um, let's see. Among other things coming out within the next year, I guess. Since we've kind so of blasted through it the It makes before. a lot of sense that Lego loss would be in a Lego game. Yeah. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to the listener, too. It was terrible. That pun was bad, and you should feel bad. Uh, since we've only got five minutes left of the show and we've already knocked out most of the year, let's go through what's remaining left in uh, 2012. Uh, Far Cry 3 com- coming out December 4th, which we'll probably check out for the purpose of reviewing. I don't know that I would get particularly invested in it, though. Not in the same way that I would. Crytek has notoriously been really good software for running computers to their full extent and I have this expensive computer that I would like to run some fancy graphics on. Put it so in spaces. That appeals to me. Fair enough. Uh lots of to be determined dates. Which I mean if they say T B A twenty twelve, I'm imagining that really means T B A twenty thirteen because twenty twelve is basically almost over. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. I'm seeing an iOS and Droid Assassin's Creed game. Is that right? Assassin's Creed Utopia. I am not familiar with one of those. Assassin's Creed Utopia. Published by Ubisoft, due out sometime in 2012. That might actually be something I have to sincerely look into. Yeah. Might be worth um, investigating. All right. Next week, you said you were going to Play Mark, Mark some ninja. ninjas. As I remember. Yes. And we also need to start getting our stuff together for To Kill a DJ, um, which is less than a month away, guys. Um, So we'll be doing a raffle. Um, There will be a huge super mega raffle. We'll be giving away probably like a thing every hour at least. Uh, So get to me on that um if you happen to know me in meet space you can get to me um otherwise send me a tweet um at nerd talk pixie like us on facebook and post something there um or sh- you can get really archaic and shoot us an email to pixie at nerd talk uh our show will be a six-hour non-stop marathon broadcast to raise money for advocate hope children's hospital family assistance fund on thursday november 15th from 6 a.m to noon and boy we really wouldn't blame you if you waited to tune in until the recorded version got posted but even if you don't listen to it live buy some raffle tickets they'll be cheap they go to charity and you might win some cool stuff And boy, have we got some cool stuff planned that I cannot actually tell you about yet, but we will totally, I don't know, do do you want to come up with some kind of deadline for at least naming some of the prizes next week? Yes, next week. Okay, so next week we will tell you just some of the prizes that will be available on the raffle, and you can start buying tickets from me then. Um, In the meantime, I'm Pixie. And I'm Parasim. And we'll catch you next Thursday on Nerd Talk.